The fortune of war has turned its back upon the Axis. For the first time, Germany's soldiers have suffered massive and crushing defeats. In the sands of the desert, the legend of Rommel has been shattered at El Alamein. In the smashed and tortured rubble of Stalingrad, the Sixth Army's surrender has destroyed the myth of the irresistible Blitzkrieg. A disaster at Dieppe and a success in North Africa teach hard-learned lessons as the Allies develop the skills of amphibious warfare that will bring liberation to Europe. In the Pacific, U.S. forces capitalize on the victory of Midway, rolling back the Japanese at Guadalcanal. Following El Alamein, Winston Churchill spoke of the end of the beginning for the Axis. The coming days and months would be the beginning of the end. The Battle of El Alamein in November 1942 had been decisive. The Africa Corps had been forced into retreat. British General Montgomery's pursuit of the German forces had been so well organized that every time in this retreat across Western Egypt and then Libya that Rommel had turned and attempted to make a stand, he had been defeated and sent on the retreat again. For the last time, the war would sweep back across Libya, across the desert over which fighting had raged back and forth for the previous two years. Early in 1943, the Africa Corps had been forced to withdraw from the Italian colony of Libya. British troops entered at Tripoli, the capital of the territory. They had expected to fight, but found the city deserted, the Axis forces having withdrawn. In the face of pursuit, the Africa Corps and its Italian allies had withdrawn into the neighboring territory of Tunisia. The fighting in the desert of Libya now began to merge with the campaigns fought by the Axis against the Anglo-American forces which had landed in Algeria and Morocco in Operation Torch. The forces were mostly American and under the command of Dwight Eisenhower. Through late 1942, these armies had advanced along the coast of Algeria towards Tunisia. The aim of the Allies was to capture the coastal ports and cut the Axis forces' lines of supply and retreat, to cut the Axis forces in two, preventing Rommel from joining up with the other Axis forces. In February, it was the turn of the Americans to encounter the genius of Rommel, when, at the Battle of Kazarin, he struck, as usual, taking his enemy by surprise. Rommel's tanks operated in terrain dismissed as difficult to armor. The German attack caught the Americans unprepared and struck at a position that could have led to a decisive defeat of the Allied forces. Italy, though, demanded caution from Rommel and prevented him from exploiting his victory. The battle was not decisive in any way, but deflated the confidence of the American forces. Time and time again, in the latter years of the war, all the genius and all the determination was to be of no avail to the Axis. In early spring of 1943, after Kazarin was not exploited and the German and Italian forces were worn down, the Allied forces were showing the coordination of air, land and sea forces that was to characterize later operations. The Desert Air Force of the RAF was increasingly effective. The Royal Navy had imposed a tight sea blockade around the Tunisian ports. The Axis forces were growing increasingly short of supplies and ammunition. Slowly, the Axis forces were pushed into a smaller and smaller pocket. In early May, the two German panzer armies in Tunisia collapsed against concentrated American attacks from the west and from the British in the south. The last Germans surrendered on May 13th. Rommel had been ordered to Germany, a sick man. 238,000 Axis forces became prisoners.
The operation in North Africa was a slow-moving process for the Allies, but lessons were learnt that were to pay results in the coming years. The war on the desert had seen important operations by the first of what were later to be called the Special Forces. It was in the Western Desert that Britain's Special Air Service Regiment was first formed. The first Special Forces had operated deep behind Axis lines, attacking supplies and airfields. Far away in Burma, in the war between the forces of the British Empire and Japan, Special Forces were also to play an important role. The Japanese army stood on the border of India, seeking to invade the most important territory of the British Empire. The two armies faced one another across the border, the British army making frontal counterattacks against the Japanese that failed to beat back the invader. The Japanese lines of supply were very long and passed through dense jungle. Britain developed new types of unit and new tactics to attack these tenuous lifelines. Units were specially trained to infiltrate deep behind the rear of the Japanese to conduct guerrilla warfare. The troops came to be called the Chindits, an anglicized corruption of the Burmese for lion. In the first wave, 3,000 Chindits entered Burma. They combined the traditional with the modern. Chindit columns cut through hot malarial jungle with mules as their means of transport. Supplies were entirely by air, enabling the Chindits to have complete independence. The men who became Chindits were special soldiers who had to endure great hardship. Their way of fighting was reminiscent of guerrilla freedom fighters. The stresses of climate and disease broke men easily. The wounded frequently had to be left alone in the forests for later rescue. The Chindits made massive sacrifices in many operations, suffering casualties of one-third. The fighting in Burma was the longest campaign fought in the war and was fought by the Japanese with two aims. They planned to invade British India, once liberated from colonial rule, as the Japanese called their Asian conquests, the wealth of the subcontinent would be used to support the Japanese war economy. The Japanese also aimed to cut the only remaining land route via which supplies could reach and support the nationalist Chinese forces, a long, tortuous road that wound through mountain and jungle. Once they had succeeded severing this lifeline, supplies could only reach China by air, and a massive logistical operation was mounted by the United States Air Transport Command to fly the material of war. The air route became known as the Hump, and was hazardous for the air crews involved, as the flights had to be made over high mountain ridges at the maximum height that the aircraft could safely operate. A pilot might have to take off in a tropical monsoon, fly through areas of severe turbulence and have to endure icing before landing. Massive resources were poured into keeping this air route open. Eventually, a maximum of more than 20,000 US airmen, 47,000 civilians and 300 aircraft were used. Britain and America saw the campaign differently. The British, under General William Slim, fought to defend territory for the sake of defending territory, to protect their Indian Empire. The British forces aimed to push back the Japanese down the length of Burma. With Burma's long coastline, an obvious strategy would have been to use the amphibious landings to outflank the Japanese. But the Allied landing craft were needed elsewhere in the world, and the British troops were condemned to fighting a long war on land with the use of the Chindits deep behind enemy lines. The British Imperial forces faced an enemy that had long and vulnerable supply lines. To supply their forces that stood on the border of India, the Japanese constructed the infamous Burma Railway. The climate of Burma's jungles ranks amongst the most unhealthy in the world. The soldiers fighting on full rations suffered badly from disease. 
Japanese contempt for both the surrendered prisoner and of other Asian peoples meant that the 61,000 Allied prisoners of war and the forced native laborers that built the railway were forced to work under conditions of slavery and made to live on a starvation diet. Those Allied soldiers fighting the Japanese little knew of the suffering endured a few hundred miles away. 12,000 prisoners and 90,000 native laborers died. The story of the Burma campaign and the railway in both fiction and history is infamous. The Americans saw the defense and recapture of Burma as a means to an end, believing it important to supply China and so place pressure on the Japanese. That would draw Imperial Japanese forces away from the Pacific and perhaps to eventually use China as a base to carry the war to the Japanese home islands. Under the leadership of U.S. General Stilwell, American troops operated in northern Burma and southern China alongside American-trained Chinese forces. Their goal was the creation of a new land route, a road and oil pipeline between India and southern China. The Americans established air bases in southern China, which were used to attack the Japanese forces in China and to attack the sea lanes through which Japan supplied its forces in the southeastern Pacific. Those occupied territories over which the Japanese had spread a wave of conquest in a series of lightning campaigns in the early months of 1942 were the target throughout 1943 of a long, drawn-out series of attacks. Attacks by Allied forces aimed to roll back the Japanese, island by island, archipelago by archipelago. The goal of the Allies was to shrink the perimeter of the vast area under Japanese domination in order that the Japanese home islands be brought under the range of strategic bomber attack. The Allied attacks came along two lines, to the south under General Douglas MacArthur, along the large islands of the South Pacific. As the forces island hopped, air bases were established, which would control areas of the Pacific, Japanese garrisons that were bypassed would then be starved of supplies through air superiority blockading their enemy. The Japanese understood the Allied strategy, and although incapable of offensive action, they took every opportunity to fortify and reinforce the islands they held. In March 1943, at the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, the United States Air Force destroyed an entire Japanese Army division at sea catching the transport ships and their escorts unawares with a surprise low-altitude attack. Australian forces fought to drive the Japanese from the island of New Guinea, which Japan had invaded as a stepping stone to Australia. Conditions for the troops that fought these New Guinea battles were terrible. Equipment had to be carried by hand along jungle tracks that switched back over a mountainous landscape. Torrential rains turning the earth to deep mud. Supplies were brought in by air or portage from New Guinean natives who fiercely opposed the Japanese invaders. The shortage of food was a constant problem for both sides 
Japanese units resorted to cannibalism of their own and of prisoners to survive. But by far the greatest killer in New Guinea was malaria, which, compounded with starvation, claimed thousands of victims in both armies. Much of the fighting was fought along the trails, which cut through the jungle. Both sides saw the possession of the forest pathways as a key to holding the island. Soldiers lived in constant fear of ambush from the dense foliage that surrounded them. To stray from the trails into the forest was to risk becoming hopelessly lost. In August 1943, the deadlock was broken when Allied air forces were able to surprise the Japanese aircraft on the ground and destroy Japanese air power in New Guinea. From that time, Allied air superiority coupled with intelligence gained from decoded Japanese signals meant that the initiative now lay with the Americans and Australians. The Japanese were to be driven into the depths of New Guinea's jungles and mountains to carry on resistance in determined defiance. To the north of MacArthur's advance, the U.S. Navy made another strategic thrust, but of a more revolutionary nature. The southern attacks were short moves of little more than 100 kilometers. They were jumps between large land masses. Such projection of force through amphibious operations were not new in military history and were projections of power that the Roman Empire would recognize. The massive industrial expansion of the Allies enabled a radical projection of force to be made. The U.S. Navy had been rebuilt following Pearl Harbor and had assembled a huge fleet of the most modern aircraft carriers. These forces enabled the American Navy to mount island hopping operations over massive distances between islands thousands of kilometers apart in the central Pacific amongst the tiny coral atolls. The forces of Japan were everywhere outnumbered and in a series of operations the American forces drew ever closer to the home islands of Japan. The spring of 1943 saw the Battle of the Atlantic reach its climax. The struggle between the submarines of Germany and the navies of Britain, America and Canada had been fought continuously during the whole time of the war. It was fought to greater and lesser intensity with the advantage moving back and forth as the technology, tactics and numerical strength available to both sides changed. The German aim was to strangle and destroy the lifeline of maritime trade upon which the Allied war effort depended. Convoys of merchant ships sailed the ocean under threat of constant attack. The German U-boat crews knew their task to be the most dangerous of any servicemen. The Battle of the Atlantic is at first understanding a straightforward struggle of numbers, an algebraic equation of war, the result, the product of many factors the volume of supplies needed to cross the Atlantic, the extent to which the British people could tighten their belts, the rates at which merchant ships and their warship escorts could be sunk, the numbers in which U-boats could be destroyed, the speed with which the shipyards of the Allies and the Axis could replace the losses. The spring of 1943 had seen the equation become ever more complex now it would be truly seen that the soldier fighting in the snows of Russia and the sands of the desert were one with the sailor and submariner fighting the same fight. With British and American forces now on the offensive in North Africa and the Pacific and indirectly supporting Russian war effort, it was the turn of the Allies to be stretched. The landing in North Africa needed support and convoys. There was more shipping at sea, and escorts had to be spread thinner. The Allies were forced to concentrate all their transatlantic shipping to one route, making the task of the U-boats easier. When in early spring 1943, the Germans were able to raise the number of U-boats all of a sudden from nowhere, the Allies were in crisis and sinking of merchant shipping grew to dangerous levels. 
But the fact remained that now the initiative lay with the Allies. In January, faced with the losses, the Battle of the Atlantic was made top priority in the strategic planning, and all effort directed into the U-boat war. Special long-range aircraft were deployed, aircraft carriers now introduced to escort groups. The Battle of the Atlantic had been a grim, long slog. Now the American and British navies forced a decisive battle, making the dark calculation that the loss of two merchant ships for each U-boat would break the German navy. By May, although shipping losses had reached their highest ever, more than 100 German submarines and their crews had been lost. The U-boats were withdrawn. It was another Allied victory, no less crucial than Stalingrad or Midway. The struggle at sea was part of the war of resources and production, the struggle between the economies, between the factories of the Axis and the Allies. It was a struggle won by Britain and America and their allies, particularly Canada, who had mobilized earlier and utilized their economies better than the Axis, mobilizing the skills and talents of women and extracting every scrap of effort and ingenuity to make more and better materials of war and release as many men as possible for the armed forces. America did not use coercion to provide the workforce. Neither men nor women were conscripted. The energy and programs of the New Deal were continued. Vast migrations of population moved across the United States, lured by war work. The British economy overmobilized and had to recall men from uniform. The direction of the individual's life in the wartime economy was complete. 10% of Britain's conscripts were sent to the coal mines, not the forces. Maintaining the effort in the war factories, where long hours were endured, once the threat of immediate invasion or defeat had passed, was difficult. High wages and natural patriotism were not enough, and war workers in all countries were the targets of extensive propaganda campaigns. In America, the famous character of Rosie the Riveter was created to motivate women workers. In Britain, General Montgomery toured factories using his own individual brand of charisma to motivate the workforce. If the battlefront and the home front really get down to it this year, we can get the thing almost finished that next year we just topple it over. It is to buy into the mythology of World War II to assume that the factories were full of happy and contented workers. There were strikes in mines and factories of Britain, despite their illegality. The Industrial War was not simply a war of quantity. It was also a war of quality. The Allies and the Axis competed to equip their armed forces with better weapons. The secret weapon, the new weapon, features large in the fiction of the war. Science and technology did play a great part in the fighting. In March 1943, in a battle of this high-technology war, the British Royal Air Force mounted its famous Dambuster raid. Using a revolutionary bomb that bounced on the surface of water, the RAF attacked the three dams in Germany's industrial region. The attack required great bravery and skill of the pilots to fly a big, high-altitude strategic bomber, the Lancaster, at low level. History merges with myth in the Dambuster story. The raid cannot be counted a success. Although there was much flooding, industry was hardly affected, and the dams soon repaired. The secret weapon, the bouncing bomb, was never used again. Many of the innovations were far less dramatic, but had greater impact. Allied fighter pilots in air-to-air -air combat enjoyed the advantages of the proximity fuse. A wartime invention, a miniature radar, would explode shells as they neared the enemy aircraft. Science contributed in many ways. Scientists and mathematicians created the new discipline of operational research into the way military operations were conducted. The optimum search pattern used by an aircraft hunting a U-boat would be the product of scientific calculation.
Much of this work remained intensely secret, unseen by the civilian and the ordinary soldier. In March 1943, the greatest secrets still remained buried deep, their full meaning known to but a few. The war of technology, though, was not one-sided. Germany had its own scientists, and in the months to come, Britain would feel the impact of Nazi secret weapons. The Dam Buster Raid was an exception to the RAF's usual tactics. And using the Lancaster throughout 1943, the intensity of the British Air Force's nighttime attacks grew ever greater. The British planes flew high at night and used area bombing. Their targets were not individual buildings or places, but entire cities or towns. Effectively, the bombs were aimed at the civilian population. In late July 1943, more than 3,000 RAF bombers attacked the city of Hamburg and caused the first man-made firestorm. The intensity of bombing plus natural weather conditions caused thousands of small fires to merge into one giant inferno. A huge fireball sat upon the city. It sucked in air at such speed that hurricane force winds were created and temperatures raised to at least 800 degrees Celsius across an area of 22 square kilometers. 45,000 people were incinerated or simply asphyxiated in this one single attack. To place these deaths in a grim context, in the whole six years of war, German attacks on Britain killed just over 60,000 civilians. The United States Air Force mounted massive daylight raids aiming to make precisely targeted attacks upon targets of strategic importance. The U.S. Air Force had practiced these surgical strikes against French targets. In these attacks, they operated under the cover of friendly fighters. In spring 1943, the U.S. AAF left its escorts behind and attacked targets deep in Germany. The crews of both American and British bombers needed courage. There were few more dangerous jobs in any regular armed forces. Nearly half of the young men who flew these missions never came home. German air defenses became ever more efficient with radar-guided anti-aircraft fire. The Luftwaffe perfected night fighter tactics and the German fighters were as deadly to unescorted bombers in daylight as had the Spitfires and Hurricanes of the RAF been in the Battle of Britain. The losses of the attacking aircraft were extremely high. When, in the autumn of 1943, the RAF began to attack Berlin, over a period of five months, it lost more than half its total strength, attacking just that one city. Losses on the American side were equally as bad, and in the end, the bombers had to be withdrawn. It was only the vast industrial effort that sustained the two air forces in their attacks. The strategic bomber offensive consumed perhaps half of the entire British war expenditure. It has been convincingly argued that in 1943, the strategic air offensive cost America and Britain more than was gained by the attacks on Germany. After the terrible Hamburg firestorm, production in the city was back at 80% of normal in just five months. During and since the war, debate has raged about both the military value and the absolute morality of strategic bomber offensives. Even during the war, the rights and wrongs of these attacks on civilian targets caused disagreement, which persists to this day. To many, the architect of British area bombing strategy, Air Marshal Arthur Harris, is classed as a war criminal. <laughs> 
In the context of the war, the deaths of perhaps as many as one million German civilians to these attacks have to be weighed against millions of other losses. Germany's major effort in the war was focused in the east. The defeat at Stalingrad in January 1943 had left Hitler shaken and fearful of decision and had left the Soviet forces temporarily exhausted. Russian offensives to follow up the Stalingrad success failed and were thrown back easily by the Germans. The German command knew that if victory were ever to be won, an offensive must be quickly mounted before new Soviet reinforcements could be brought to bear. A plan was devised to attack and destroy the Soviet forces at Kursk, where a large salient protruded from the line dividing the two armies. This would be Germany's last chance to win the war in the east. The Soviets, realizing attack was imminent, poured resources into the area, creating massive defenses. Huge numbers of Russian artillery sat in prepared positions. On July 5, 1943, the Germans attacked. The Battle of Kursk remains the largest tank battle in history. 4,000 Russian tanks met 3,000 German machines. For 10 days, a battle the like of which none had seen before raged. The tanks engaged in a near continuous melee individual tank versus individual tank. The Germans nearly won, but their losses were too great. Nazi strength was exhausted. The German tank strength was cut to less than a quarter. The last offensive ended in failure, with the destruction of the entire German reserve tank force. After Kursk, the German forces could never again take the initiative. The losses were so great, they could never again be made up. Hitler ordered that the German army retreat behind a specially constructed line of defenses to be called the East Wall and hold that line. Resources, though, had not been available for its construction. And for its most part, the East Wall remained a line on the map. The Russian forces paid heavily for their victories in the expenditure of both material and human life. Yet in sharp contrast to the Nazis, the numerical strength of the Soviet forces continued to grow, drawing on the vast reserves of the huge Soviet population and country. Following the summer, the Soviet army paused to regroup and plan for an offensive in the winter under conditions that naturally favored the Russian soldier. As the first frosts of the winter fell in October and November, the Russian army began attacks across the whole length of the front. The initiative lay with the Soviets. Their vast material advantage over the Germans enabled the Red Army to strike where it desired, where the Nazi enemy's strength was at its weakest. In the coming months, the Russian army would deal alternating blows as a boxer throwing punches to the left and then the right, constantly hammering the opponent into retreat. The German army fought a determined defensive battle, obeying Hitler's command, stoutly refusing to give ground. Through this strategy, German unit after German unit became caught in dangerous positions, exposed to attack on three sides, in terrain that offered no easy way out, or even actually surrounded in vast pockets of men and arms. Hitler was persuaded in January 1944 to retreat, and in a series of battles, the endangered forces were pulled out. In the north of Russia, the narrow corridor of territory which had connected the besieged city of Leningrad was widened, and the blockade of the city finally lifted with German forces driven back. By early 1944, the Soviet Union had recaptured strategically important regions of the Ukraine. Russian forces had even reached the 1939 eastern border of Poland. In the face of the seemingly endless growth of Soviet strength, Hitler's generals appealed to the dictator for reserves. They were told that invasion was imminent in France, 
and no strength could be spared. In the summer of 1943, when the Battle of Kursk was at its height, Hitler had been distracted by yet another challenge from the Allies. On July 10th, the American forces under George S. Patton and British troops commanded by Bernard Montgomery landed in Sicily. The aim of the attack was to surround Germany with pressure on all sides and force Hitler to draw strength away from Russia. The Americans were unconvinced about the landing. They believed it another of Churchill's wild, indirect strategies and thought the attack should instead be made in northern Europe. Yet that attack could not yet be mounted, and powerful arguments were made that forces flushed with victory and battle experience in North Africa would be ill-used if sent back to Britain to sit in camps awaiting fresh action. Needless to say, this last was a judgment of high command, not the soldier on the ground. The invasion of Sicily was to a pattern repeated in the latter years of the war. A deception had been perpetrated on the Germans. A dead body was placed by a British submarine, a supposed victim of a plane crash. The dead man carried papers which said that the preparations aimed at Sicily were a ruse, that the real target was Greece. The Germans were fooled. The pattern of closely coordinated attacks by the armies, air forces and navies of different countries meant that the British and American forces landed against only weak opposition. The terrain of Italy was easily defended and made the use of armor difficult. The Italian forces fought weakly and half-heartedly, but German forces made stiff resistance. Using seaborne force to outflank successive German lines of defense, the Germans were driven back and evacuated the island by the end of July. The capture of Sicily brought little military advantage. The German forces drawn into the campaign were not in the main taken from Russia. The Allied lines of communication to the Middle East, which Sicily threatened, were already secure. Yet the invasion did bring about dramatic political change in Italy. The Italian high command, who had never truly accepted Mussolini and fascism, were convinced by the failure of the Italian forces that Italy should change sides. On July 25th, Mussolini was arrested and imprisoned, and the new Italian government immediately entered secret negotiations with the Allies. In early September, British forces landed at Calabria, in the toe of Italy. A few days later, on September 8th, the Italian government surrendered. The Germans had anticipated this, and the Axis ally rapidly became an Axis-occupied country. The next day, a combined British and American force landed at Salerno, south of Naples. The aim of the two landings was to capture southern Italy in a giant pincer movement. The experience of the two halves to this operation stand in sharp contrast. The southern landing went unopposed and scarcely can be called an invasion. In the north, disaster threatened. The beaches were overlooked by high ground on all sides. Extremely well-organized German counterattacks held the first troops on the landing grounds, while powerful reinforcements were hurried to the battle. The German forces were built up quicker than those of the Allies. The airfields that the Allies captured and intended to use for reinforcements were kept under fire by the Germans. New weapons, the earliest guided missiles, were used by the Nazis to attack warships supporting the invaders. Within days, the Americans and British were in a desperate position, 
and plans were being made for evacuation. To save the situation, U.S. paratroopers were dropped onto the beachhead. Naval warships hurried extra troops from Egypt. Extra battleships of the Royal Navy were brought to bear, and the British RAF in the Mediterranean abandoned strategic bombing and brought its heavy bombers to bear in tactical ground support. Eventually, the other half of the Allied forces coming from the south joined up, and simple weight of numbers made the German forces withdraw to form a new defensive position to the north. While the fighting at Salerno was at its height, German special forces made a daring raid and rescued Mussolini from his captivity. The Italian dictator was installed by the Germans as the dictator of a tiny fascist puppet state in the north of Italy. The comparative success of the Germans at Salerno convinced Hitler that the Italian campaign should be fought in a spirit of complete defiance, that not a centimeter of ground should be yielded. The campaign was to become a long drag of attrition, to be fought up the entire length of the Italian peninsula. The Allied armies were forced to make frontal assault after frontal assault against prepared German positions. Wider demands on Allied resources meant that the British and American armies were matched numerically by the Germans. Only in air power did the Allies have an advantage. The German troops were of the highest quality. Their defensive positions dug in place in steep rocky hillsides were not easy targets for the air forces. The Germans had only to defend. Shortages of fuel did not affect troops which had no need to maneuver. The Italian campaign saw the greatest involvement in World War II by South American forces. Brazil had declared war upon Germany in response to the intense provocation of repeated U-boat attacks upon Brazilian shipping. 25,000 Brazilian troops took part in the fighting in Italy. The fighting in Italy has been described as that part of World War II which most came to resemble the First World War where attackers were forced to make assault after assault against fixed lines of defenders with vast expenditure of life for tiny gains of territory. If there was a battle that was the equivalent of the Western Front, it is the Battle of Monte Cassino. The German army held a tall hill, atop which sat a medieval monastery. The hill dominated the entire line separating the armies. It was a position that controlled the whole front. No progress could be made unless the Allies took the hill that the Germans had made into a fortress. Between January and May 1944, a series of battles were fought to take Casino. Ever heavier bombardments were piled upon the town and hill that created ruins that made the defenders' task even easier. A succession of commanders poured more and more troops in a succession of attacks that appeared to grow increasingly fruitless. Bad weather compounded the difficulties of the attackers. Soldiers who had fought in both battles said the terrain resembled that of the Battle of the Somme. To the north of Casino, the Allies made an attempt to break this deadlock. At Anzio, on the coast, another combined amphibious landing was made. It would threaten the Germans at Casino. It could threaten to attack Rome and capture the Italian capital. This attack, too, became bogged down against determined German attacks that were both well-planned and skillfully improvised by some of Germany's better troops. The Germans forced the Allies to reverse their strategy. Attacks had to be redoubled upon Casino to relieve the pressure at Anzio. The spring of 1944 saw a dramatic change in the war in the air. In response to the heavy losses inflicted by the fighters of the Luftwaffe, the United States Army Air Force brought a new weapon into play, the P-51 Mustang Long Range Fighter. The British Royal Air Force held that any fighter capable of making the mission deep into Germany alongside the bombers would not in effect be a fighter. The weight of fuel such a craft would have to carry would make it impossible to obtain a performance to match that of Germany's excellent fighters.
The Mustang owed its extended range to the simple invention of the underwing drop tank, made of cardboard, which could carry the extra fuel to extend the aircraft's range, and then be dropped to improve performance. The new fighters were not simply long range, they were also of a superior design as fighting machines that could match any fighter that the Luftwaffe could put into the sky. As 1943 turned into 1944, the United States Army Air Force began a bombing campaign which was in the end to prove decisive. The bombers were now used to draw up the defending fighters that were engaged by the Mustangs. Now, the war of numbers, the war fought in the factories of industrial might began to tell against the Germans. The Americans were able to slowly and systematically destroy the Luftwaffe's fighter force plane by plane, pilot by pilot. In February, mass attacks by the long-range fighters were coupled with bombing raids by both RAF and US Air Forces aimed at German fighter production. Factories were targeted for the full weight of the Allied air forces. Plane by plane, pilot by pilot, the German air force was destroyed. As its strength grew weaker, the task of those pilots that remained grew more difficult. It became easier for the USA to make daylight raids, easier for the RAF at night. In the late autumn of 1943, for the first time, all three leaders of the Allies met together at Tehran, in Iran. Britain and America agreed that the invasion of France would go ahead in the following year, accompanied by landings in the south of France. Stalin agreed that the Soviet Union would mount an offensive in the east at the same time. There was an unwritten and highly secret agreement that once the war against Germany had been won, the Soviet Union would attack Japan. Nowhere in the world could the Axis forces take the initiative. Nowhere could they carry war to their enemy. Axis strategists were helpless to counter Allied attacks, bereft of inspiration that would counter the moves of their opponents. Everywhere, the Axis soldier waited behind defenses, scanning the horizon for the signs of attack. Everywhere, the Axis civilian lived in fear. In the spring of 1944, the warring world knew the end game of the fight was about to begin. A year before, the Allies at the Casablanca Conference had spelled out their war aim as the unconditional surrender of the Axis forces. Now they prepared to take the final steps that would destroy their enemy. Next time on World War II, The Complete History, the deadlock breaks at the Battle of Monte Cassino and Rome falls to the Allies. As Rome is liberated, the great invasion of Northwestern Europe begins on D-Day with Operation Overlord. The greatest amphibious operation in the history of warfare sees Allied armies swarm ashore the coast of Normandy. Simultaneously, American armies land in southern France. By the end of the summer, free French leader Charles de Gaulle leads a victorious entry into Paris. Swamped by the force of numbers, the Nazis respond with secret weapons, using technology that belongs to the future. The first cruise missile, the V-1, appears in the skies of England. Then, more deadly, the first ballistic missile, the V-2, brings death to London. The British government at first denies that a new weapon has been unleashed. An attempted assassination of Hitler fails. In the Pacific, the Japanese islands come within range of new giant B-29 bombers that bring systematic devastation to Japan's cities. Douglas MacArthur fulfills his vow to return to the Philippines. Japan invokes mythology and history with the kamikaze suicide attacks. Everywhere, the Nazis are rolled back. Greece 
is liberated, but there is no peace for its people as civil war breaks out and Greek kills Greek on the streets of Athens. Attempting to shorten the war, British General Montgomery commits his airborne forces too far with attacks upon Rhine crossings at Arnhem. The result is disaster, and the war continues into yet another year.